Okay, well, the, the height of the book of Romans, um, chapter 8, it is the, the greatest point in the book <laughs> when we realize, and as we've been looking, we started chapter 8 two weeks ago, and then last week we covered quite a bit, and now we're just about to verse 28, even though we read 28 uh, last week, we'll, we'll pick it up there and just go to the end of the, the, the chapter. I almost said we'll pick it up and go to the end of the book. Aren't you glad that that's not the plan? <laughs> um, so chapters 1, 2, and 3, just for some review... Uh, lets us know the problem of sin. It's also introducing us. Uh, somebody put it best, I think. You really can't appreciate the solution until you understand the problem. I'll say that again. <laughs> you really don't appreciate the solution, which in this case is Jesus Christ. You don't fully appreciate and grasp the solution, Jesus Christ, until you realize and understand what? The problem. And that's what chapters 1, really all the way through 7, are about, is this problem of sin. Remember even in chapter 7, Paul says, it's not me that does it, this awful thing, these awful things. It's the sin in me, the sin that dwells in me. And it's realizing and understanding we are all sinners. Romans 3 lets us know all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And above, uh, on top of that, that the wages of sin is death. And so you would be just totally uh, hopeless and left. If the book of Romans ended at chapter 7, you would be left hopeless and wondering what the heck? But thank God for Romans chapter 8. Um, one of my uh, favorite teachers was saying that if he had one thing that he could have with him on an island, one book or section of a book, it would be Romans chapter 8. Um, and part of it is understanding these treasures are for you. It's for me. There is no condemnation. We talked about that. See, we get into condemning ourselves. We, we don't need anyone to help us do that. We just constantly fail, and then the enemy starts to get you and condemning yourself. That's what condemnation is. And so, how glorious Romans chapter 8 started out with there is no condemnation, but it doesn't end there. There's also no obligation. We talked about that. That is, you're not obligated to sin. In the same way, you're not obligated to keep all of the rules and the regulations. Um, and then there's also uh, no separation. That's what we're going to get into uh, tonight. So, verse Romans chapter 8, beginning, pick it back up at verse 28 again. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose, for whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. And with all of that in mind, what, verse 31, what shall we say then? Or what shall we then say to these things? And <coughs> there would almost be a pause there. Um, I wonder if Paul, in writing this, took a long pause between in, in the middle of verse 31. 
before he goes on to say, if God be for us, who can be against us? But what shall we then say to these things? Um, I think so many of us reach a point sometimes where we forget. We forget to stop and just take in what's been said. That all things work together for good to those who are called according to the will of God, probably the most, according to His purpose, the most important part of that verse. Um, and then letting us know that, really, it had nothing to do with you. It had nothing to do with me. That's what predestination's all about. You've been elected, you've been chosen before the foundations of the earth. All I did was respond to the call. Just, just like Abraham, just like Isaac, just like Jacob, just like Joseph. We just respond. And we're just born again. Um, and taking all that in, what can you say to that? <laughs> Remember David, it makes me think of David, King David, when he wanted to build a temple for God. Remember, he, how can I dwell in this great palace and God's out there in that little box in the tent. Remember that, King David? I want to build God a temple. I want to build the temple for the Lord. And he did. And he went to Nathan, and Nathan said, Sounds like a good idea. How can you go wrong? Well, he spoke too soon. And God showed up, remember, to Nathan and said, No, David's a bloody man. His, ha his hands have blood on them. He's a man of war. But your son, Solomon, will build my temple. But I love your heart, David, my translation. God said, you won't build me a house, but I will build you a house. How's that for God? Mm -hmm. And it's the only place that probably all of David's life came to a halt in words. He said, what can I say? You're going to build me a house? And he's <laughs> kept his promise. The house of David will continue forever. That's the idea there. Not a literal building, but a house. Meaning his lineage, the, the throne of David, <laughs> is yet to be fulfilled. The throne of all of the other kings come to an end. They have all come to an end. But the throne of David is forever. And David listens to this from God. And he's at a loss of words. What shall we say to these things? Kind of the same idea. I think the highest point of praise. I really do think the highest point of praise that we can come to sometimes is total silence. It's absolute awe and wonder. And just complete marvel. It's not what we think of as praise and worship. I walk by faith. Or blowing horns and dancing and running through the aisles. That's really, it's great to do that. It's fun, right? Nothing wrong with that. But compared to what can I say to these things? You know, you look at your kids, you look at your wife, you look at your husband, sorry gals, and you just think, gosh, Lord, you've blessed me. I'm at a loss of words. I'm so incredibly loved. And that's what we're going to get into tonight. That's what the end of Romans chapter 8 is all about. It's God's love. It really is. And it's all about God's love. What can be said about all of the things up to that point? Verse 31. If God be for us, the rest of verse 31, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him, that is his own son, he delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things. Amen? 
if he doesn't hold, withhold his one and only begotten son, what else would you think he's holding back on? He will give you freely. <laughs> and somebody said wisely that all things could have all good things in front of it. Because many of us would go and look at a boat saying, Lord, you said you'd give me all things freely. But guess what? That boat may not be good for you. Probably not. But I could go and witness to a lot of people with a boat, Lord. We can rationalize the things in our head, right? Amen. But it's all good things, really. When it's God that, that gives it to you freely, He knows what's good for us. He really does. And uh, He spared not His own Son. The only other time that word is used in the Old Testament, I believe. It could have been used in the New Testament other places, but the only time that word is ever used in the Old Testament, spared, is in Genesis 22 of all places, where Abraham takes Isaac, old man Isaac, he's 33 years old, despite what the coloring books in your children's class, <laughs> Isaac was not a little kid, <laughs> but he was an older, he was middle-aged, 33, and Abraham took him up on the mount, remember? The same mount that Jesus Christ would carry the wood up. We talked a lot about that going through Genesis. The pictures can be seen. And God stops Abraham from plunging the knife into his one and only son, whom he loved. And he said, I will provide a sacrifice. I will be the sacrifice. And now I know, Abraham, that you have not spared your son from me. And just as the picture is perfect, God, too, did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us. For us all. Who shall lay anything, verse 33, <coughs> who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. And I like the way somebody put it. It's, it's as if a, a police officer is pulling over someone and then he finds out the very kid that he pulled over is the judge's son. He says, how can I lay any charge against the judge's son, when it's the judge that justifies. It's the judge that executes judgment. <laughs> and that's the idea here. Who's going to lay anything against God's elect? That is you. That's me. Well, the, the uh, sad truth of that statement is a lot of people, including myself, will charge a lot of things against God's elect. Did you hear about Pastor so-and-so? And what he's been caught doing? And we lay charges after charges. We're good at that. It's all we do. And we seem to love the gossip and the, <laughs> the negative stories that are out there. Tearing God's people apart. It just is what we cling to. We talk about it. I'm guilty of it too. But who could do that? Ultimately, it's, it's Satan himself. He's the accuser of the brethren, bringing accusations against all of you and, and me, day and night, the scripture says. That serpent, Satan, he's real. And he lays charges and says, you expect to come to God in prayer? You expect to open that book and I'm going to speak to you after the life you've been leaving, leading and the, and the things you've been doing? That's Satan. Am I the only one? That's, that's the charges he brings. The, the accusations, the accusing of, of us. But who could do that when it's God 
that justifies. Verse 34, Who is he that condemns? It is Christ that died. Any condemnation has been absorbed by Jesus Christ on the cross. That's, and any charge that could be bring, brought against us. It's all been uh, resolved. It's all been handled at the foot of the cross. At Jesus Christ and his death. Yea, verse 34. Rather, that is risen... Sorry, I've got to read that over from the start. <laughs> Verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, and get this, he makes intercession for us. And Hebrews go, takes that a little bit further and says, he ever lives to make intercession for us. He's at the right hand of the Father in heaven and just praying on your behalf, just bringing all those accusations that come. He's knocking them down one by one and saying, no, that's been covered. He's been clothed. She's my daughter. Could, Jess, could you get a glass of water for me, please? Thanks. Um, the only time I didn't bring one up here with me. <laughs> but he's at the right hand of the Father making intercession. Thank you. I love you. What a sweetie. <laughs> so... It's Christ that not only died, verse 34, but He's risen again. And that's, again, <laughs> He's risen from the, the grave. And that's part of why He can make such intercession for us. Why He is the mediator between God and man. Or the one that would reconcile God, the maker of all of us, and man. It's because He conquered death. Nobody else has done that, ever, in the history of the world. Nobody, there's been claims, but they end up dying again. Somebody's been raised from the dead, or somebody, you know, died for a little bit, and then came back and wrote a book and made a movie about it. But one who died and then rose again and still lives, and he will ever live, <laughs> To make intercession for us. It's one of the, the reasons he can be at the right hand of God and make intercession. Is that he's risen again. You can never be too into. You can never be obsessed enough with the resurrection. I hope you know that. It's what it's all about. It's not just Easter. It's not just one day a year. I'm glad we have a day, Resurrection Day, to, to celebrate it. But we, we as believers, this is the pinnacle. This is the very hinge that all Christianity hangs on. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in its entirety. 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter. It lets you know that there would be nothing without that event. And it's kind of the same thing here. Christ we would have no hope in Christ without that resurrection, without that power of the resurrection. And to take it further, verse 35 makes it even better. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecutions or famine or nakedness or peril or swords? As it is written, for thy sake... We are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Verse 37. Nay, in all these things we are conquerors. Oh no, it doesn't say that. See, there's many conquerors all around. They conquer the world. They're out there taking on the day. Seizing the day. And they get a lot done, man. And it's all for the almighty dollar. 
They get a lot done and it's all for themselves. But see, we are, what does he say? More than conquerors. More than those who would take a city. More than those who would control an army. In fact, the proverb says, he who controls his anger has this fruit of the Spirit called self-control. He who has that mastered is greater than anyone that would take a whole city and conquer a whole land. That's how you and I are more than conquerors. Through Him. Now it has, again, this <laughs> emphasizing, it has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with me and how strong I am. Or how smart I am. <laughs> you all know that. <laughs> it has nothing to do with, with any of that. But it's all God. It's the end of verse 37. We're more than conquerors, what? Through Him, capital H. Him that loved us. For I am persuaded. Now Paul, again, almost to the point of speechless, but he's a great orator, he's a great writer. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, for nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from, and I underlined these two words, the love. Because a lot of people have used this scripture very twistingly and said that this, for some reason, that they don't emphasize the love enough. <laughs> the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, they would say, nothing can separate you, nor angels, nor demons, nor anything, and everyone. Nothing can come between you and God as your Savior, Jesus Christ, your Savior. And so, thus, you can do whatever you want. You can sin all you want. You can live any which way you want, as long as you prayed that prayer when you were four years old. If you can remember when you were four years old, right? As long as you were sprinkled as an infant, you're secure, you're safe. No, don't believe that. And is this... <laughs> See, I think the reason that this isn't popular, nobody does emphasize the love of Christ in this passage, is because then it, it seems like, well, what's the big deal then with the passage? You know, if it's not for me and my security in Christ, that I can go to heaven and do what I want and I'll be forgiven. No, listen, Jesus loves Judas. He chose him. Jesus loves the most demented, twisted, perverted, wicked enemy of God. Jesus loves that person. God loves that person. So again, what's the big deal with this? <laughs> And I love the way Rich Mullins put it. <laughs> we just, I just listened to this recently too on YouTube. Rich Mullins said, you know, I was a struggling kid that grew up in church and youth group and my youth pastors would come up and see me just depressed and the, the gloomy look and they would say something that never helped. They would look at me and they said, you know, God loves you. And they'd smile and he would just kind of look at them as teenagers can and say, so what? God loves me? God loves everybody. So what? And he, he goes on to say, that just proves that God has no taste. <laughs> he loves me. <laughs> and I'm glad. Aren't you glad that God doesn't have taste? <laughs> he does. He truly loves everybody. And, and make sure that you remember that this passage is talking about the love of God and not salvation as a whole. That was dealt with back in verses 30, 29 and 30, really. The whom he predestined, he called, whom he called, he justified, whom he justified, he glorified. That's salvation, folks. 
And if God can justify Jacob, again, if God can save Jacob, any one of you can come. It doesn't matter where you've been. And what I love about the love of God, it's not the love of man. I was just reminded of John chapter 2. That chapter, John chapter 2, it's really interesting. Something that happens in John chapter 2. Actually, two things that happen. And one is the marriage feast. Everybody knows the story. Probably all of you are familiar with it. And Jesus is sitting at a marriage feast, and people are getting drunk. There's, there's wine flowing. And guess what happens at that wedding feast, John chapter 2? They run out of wine. Uh-oh. But then there's another thing going on. As you read on in John chapter 2, there's another table. And it's the money changers. And they're in the temple of God where they are selling doves and lambs for sacrifices and doing the work of God. And this is the love of God. This is the love of Christ. You would think that he, at that table with the drunkards and the wine bibbers, and that's what Jesus was called too, by the way, <laughs> at, at that table, surely, Jesus would turn those tables over and get in their face about getting drunk and drinking all day. Surely that's what Jesus would do. But rather, he turns the tables around on everyone. And Jesus always did the unexpected in his time. Everyone expected him to go and pat the religious folks in the, in the temple selling all those things on the back and say, what a good job you're doing here on the Sabbath, making it available for people to make sacrifice. No, did he do that? No, he had the harshest things to say to religious folks. Somebody said, why, why at church? That's where people get yelled at by the guy up there. What's happening there? Well, Jesus had the harshest things to say, maybe shouting at times, to people that were religious. People that were into duty. Into, not that kind of duty. Somebody was thinking about it. Into works. They were into, you know, what I can do for God. That's religion. I hope that you... Don't ever think that there's anything you can do for God. That's a fallacy. That's something that we all fall into. Christianity, what Jesus was about, and what this is all about, the love of Christ. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Even your good works aren't going to separate you. He loves you so much. He loves me so much. It's all about what He has done. It's nothing that I'm doing for Him. It's all about what He has accomplished and is doing right now. I like that. Nor things present, nor things to come. What happened, what happened to the past? Do you know that's what God's like? The past, don't worry about that. That's, that's done away with. And it doesn't affect things present and things to come. In God's economy, that's, where the, what, that's what there is. Is things present and things to come. And the past isn't even mentioned. Isn't that awesome? When you know your own past? It's not even mentioned. It's the things that are present and things to come. And somebody said, what are you presently doing? Just like God coming in the garden, we all re familiar with the story of Genesis, the Garden of Eden, and He comes in not stern and loud and shouting like a police officer or uh, somebody in charge saying, Where are you, Adam? After Adam had sinned. But rather, He says, Where are you? And he says the same thing to, to you, to me, even right now. 
Where are you? Are you far from me? Am I out of your reach? You guys are blessed. You're here tonight. There's some that just don't really see the point of coming to church, coming to Bible study. I really don't get it. I can do a lot more things. I can, you know, spend my time doing things that are productive, they might think. But God says, where are you? And that's, that's what God always wants to know, presently, and for things to come. Where are you? And things to come comes into play there, doesn't it? Because <laughs> what you choose to do now affects greatly your things to come for you. Uh, Christian did a great job uh, Sunday morning looking at the blessings and the, and the uh, prophesying over the children, the 12 sons. Guess what? All those sons didn't all live happily ever after and go to heaven. It was only those who trusted and obeyed. Only those who were in Christ. And I think he started the message, Christian started the message by saying, we're going to look and see what happens to those who are in Christ and what happens to those who are apart from Christ. It's the same thing as you go throughout the Word. And that reality becomes clearer. How could you not be more than a conqueror when it's there for you? When all you have to do is trust and obey. All you have to do is just respond to the call. And which, by the way, all are welcome, right? He doesn't turn anyone away. Nobody's, you know, too far gone. That's, again, the work of the enemy. He gets people to believe, no, not me. I've done too much. There's no way God would forgive me. That, that person doesn't exist. Nobody has gone too far for God not to pull them back if they repent, if they continue, if, that's a huge if. Because, again, God's sovereignty, God's will is that none would perish, that all would come to repentance. Why doesn't that happen? Because we have this thing called a choice. God decided to put a tree in that garden and say, you can't have that. You think God knew what he was doing? I want you to love me. I want you to choose to love me. And he does the same thing to all of us presently. I had a drug problem. I was drugged to church all the time. <laughs> but I thank God that I grew up in church but there came a moment there came a time where you can only drag someone to church and what do they say you can only lead a horse to the water you cannot make that horse drink and though there's many parents many of us that bring our children to church and we, we do the work that we're called to do. We raise them up in the Lord. But there comes a time, doesn't there, for every one of us, choose you this day whom you'll serve. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. But choosing Him and the love that's in Christ Jesus, why would you choose the love that's elsewhere? It's futile. It's always depending on what they ate the night before. The love of humans is totally uh, fickle. Is that the right word? It's, it's just not dependable, right? Yeah. Always depending on what you ate the night before, you know. Don't live your life by your feelings or emotions. Hang on to God's love. It's a sure thing, right? It's all about God's love. And nothing, what God has joined together, what God has brought together, what does he say? Let no one separate. There will not be any separation. 
The same thing is being spoken of here. Paul just throws all these other things in. And it's interesting too, Paul experienced in that list, verse 35, um, Paul himself experienced that list. Tribulation, distress, persecutions, famine, nakedness, uh, peril, and swords, or, or fighting. Read about what Paul went through. We think we're persecuted. <laughs> Read about what the Christians there in, in Iraq and uh, China and today, presently, those little children that were beheaded simply for not renouncing their faith. Afghanistan, Afghanistan thank you. And just amazing the things that, that are going, but the rewards that await and the love that they knew, they, they, nothing can separate that, not even death. Do you understand that? We know that death can't separate us, but life, it's interesting. He says, nor death nor life. Some people, they let life separate them, not from the love of Christ, but from Christ. I just want to live life to its fullest. Amen. And Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, John 10, 10, I came to give you life. And that more abundantly. We don't know what living is. We still have sin. In this world. We, we, all we've ever known is sin. Life really starts in this abundant life. And it does start today. It does start when we gave our lives to Christ. When we really became in Christ. It starts that abundant life. But we... Earlier in the chapter, with all of creation, we groan for this time that will be no sin. There will be no, we can't even imagine. But it's amazing, isn't it? Are you persuaded? He was, Paul was, and for what he went through, I would hope that you understand and I think it's worth also saying that nor angels, somebody's included in that, angels, Satan himself. He cannot separate you from the love of Christ. Jesus loves you. And when we get that, it's huge. When we fully understand that, for ourselves personally. We can spend so much time studying, so much time even in prayer, that we don't realize and we don't uh, take the moment to say, you know what? Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. <laughs> I'm just a little one. To Him I belong. I'm so weak. But he's strong. Amen? Amen? Father, thank you for your word this evening. Even as we sing these last few songs, Lord, would you just show us more of your love, more of your power, just more of you, and less, less of our distractions, less of our flesh and sin. Lord, just... How so much around us, it's, it's just this sinful world, but we thank you that nothing can separate us from the love that you have for each and every one of us in this room. God, how that you are just waiting so often, you're just waiting for us to be finished with our sin, our flesh, our stuff. And we just want to worship you and thank you that you love us, Lord. How can we respond by nothing else but just singing out, just spending a time together in worship. Amen. <laughs>